I greet you, ladies and gentlemen, as I start my lecture on the term structure of interest rate. Uh, I must admit and uh, point out at the onset that uh, the purpose of my coverage of this topic is to just tease out certain details so that those who want to investigate the concepts that uh, I'm mentioning, the main concepts, they can investigate them further. There's a lot of material on YouTube and also when you Google uh, on the term structure of interest rate, you get a lot of material. And the coverage is from the elementary to the most advanced coverage that you can think of, uh, up to concepts to do with stochastic finance. Since we are not doing a module in uh, in financial economics per se, but it's a module on monetary economics and we're covering quite a number of themes. What we cover are just the basic or the foundational concepts under the term structure of interest rate. Here and there, we may just encounter one or two calculations, one or two instances of calculations, but we're just covering the basic concepts or the foundational concepts as it were or rather revise the foundational concepts because in this degree, the master of science in, in, in banking and financial economics, there is actually financial economics, which is done as a module and treasury management, as well as a number of other modules or courses where issues to do with term structure actually covered in, in granular details. So without wasting time, after this preliminary introduction, I'm going to share my notes. So in our previous lecture, we covered from the definition of the term structure of interest rates, and we looked at different types of yield curve. First, we looked at the normal yield curve and what it shows us, and also the inverted yield curve uh, as number two. And then we looked at the steep yield curve, which is just a version of uh, the, the, the normal yield curve, but which is rather st steep. Uh, showing that uh, long-term yields are rising at a faster rate than short-term yields. And then we also looked at uh, the flat yield curve, where there is sort of a, a scenario where uh, all maturities have similar yield. When we're looking at, when we're saying all maturities, we are talking of different financial instruments. Uh, different finance, three months, six months, year, two year, all financial securities, they've got basically different yields such that there is no risk premium provision for, whole, for investing long term. We know that uh, in the ordinary run of things, long term investments or long-term bonds, they tend to be more interest sensitive than short-term bonds. So there is paribus. And this is taken as a transition from the uh, normal yield curve, which is upward sloping to an inverted yield curve. That at a certain point, it becomes flat on its way to being downward sloping or flipped or inverted. And then we've got the humped yield curve where the medium term yields are greater than the outlier yields, the short term and the long term yields. And this is very rare. It normally indicates that the economic activity is slowing down. So because economic activity will be slowing down, this is what explains this phenomenon where medium term yields they tend to be greater than their short-term or long-term counterparts. 
And then the determinants of yield curve shape or behavior. We mentioned things like inflation, economic growth, interest rates, and interest rates. Inflation, when we, we uh, in my previous lecture, I covered about the Fisher effect and the Fisher equation, how it factors into the reckoning of interest rates or the calculation of interest rates. And we realized that uh, the nominal interest rate is simply the real interest rate plus the inflation rate, such that when we make the real interest rate the subject of the formula, the real interest rate becomes the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. And then there is that expanded formula that uh, we experimented with, with uh, also a tutorial example as well. So, and then with economic growth. So with inflation, a rise in expected inflation, uh, you know, spawns an increase in interest rates. And the rise in inflation leads to a decrease in the purchasing power, and therefore, in the purchasing power of money. And therefore, invest investors expect an increase in the short-term interest rate. To, to cater for that expected rise in inflation or the actual rise in inflation. Because remember I said inflation acts as, a, as an implicit tax of some sort, which tends to eat into the actual value of financial assets. Since the interest rate is subtracted from the nominal value of a financial asset. And then we have got economic growth, strong economic growth, normally causes an upset in inflation in the economy, so there is paribus, due to its impact on aggregate demand. We know that when aggregate demand keeps increasing and the increase is sustained over time, it may cause inflationary pressures to build, and sometimes to even boil over to galloping inflation or high levels of inflation or even hyperinflation like what was experienced in Zimbabwe between 2005 and 2008. And then interest rates. Uh, before I move on to interest rates, we realize that strong economic growth leads to an increase in yields and a steeper yield curve. So the, in contrast, uh, when economic growth is weak, it means uh, the, the performance of uh, yields is rather subdued. And then the yield curve will be more of a plateauing curve rather than a steeper one. Here I'm not even talking about a downturn in economic activity. I'm talking about an economy which is still growing, but which is actually slowing down. So the yield curve will tend to plateau. There will be the steep part and the part where it is plateauing, so to speak. And then with interest rates, if the central bank raises interest rates, obviously via the, the bank rate on treasuries, this increase will result in higher demand for treasuries. Because a rise in interest rates implies that the price of the financial asset, which is the treasury bill in this case, which is styled or named treasury, the price will go down. If the interest rate is increasing, the price will go down, given the inverse relationship between the present value of a, a financial asset and the interest rate. So the implication is that uh, if the interest rate is reduced and by corollary, the price of the financial asset increases, uh, uh, this uh, will uh, lead to a scenario where the demand for treasury will actually go down. If interest rates are, are reduced, 
and the price of the treasure has increased. We expect the demand, the demand of various treasuries or treasury pins, various classes or tenors of the treasury pins. We expect their demand to go down. And when that demand goes down, um, this affects the, the yield of uh, uh, interest rate denominated financial assets or interest sensitive financial assets. And then the importance of the yield curve. We know the yield curve can also um, be used by investors to act as a parameter for mapping out the likely trajectory of interest rates in the future. And then uh, yield curves are also used by financial intermediaries um, in their decision making on uh, loaning funds to their customers or participation in money markets. We know that banks and other financial intermediaries borrow most of their funds by selling short-term deposits and lend by using long-term long loans. Uh, if the yield curve, which is upward sloping as a steeper slope, the white, wider the difference between, it implies that the difference between lending and borrowing rates will be white and the profit margin will improve and the profit will be high. So if the yield curve is flat or even downward sloping, this translates to a decrease in the profits of the financial intermediaries. So banks, merchant banks, unit trusts, finance houses, stock broking firms and so on, they pay attention to the behavior of the yield curve because it, uh, it affects their profitability. The, the, the behavior of the yield curve serves as a parameter and index for projecting or forecasting the profitability of these financial intermediaries. The trade off between maturity and yield. The yield curve helps to indicate the trade off between maturity and yield. If the yield curve is upward sloping, then to increase one's yield, the investor must invest in long, longer term securities, which will mean more risk. So if you go for a financial assets with longer maturity, you are likely to, 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 to get more given an upward sloping yield curve. But the, the caveat is, is that uh, there will be more risk that you'll be taking because economic conditions may change. There might be a Ukraine before your financial assets actually mature and there is an upset in inflation. By the time you are liquidating your financial asset and realizing uh, the higher returns associated with an increase in the yield, which in turn will be associated with the upward sloping nature of the yield curve, would have been partially implicitly taxed by the inflation problem due to an increase in the price of crude oil, for instance, and other related commodities. Number four overpriced or underpriced securities. The curve can indicate for investors whether a security is temporarily overpriced or underpriced. If a security's rate of return lies above the yield curve, this indicates that the security is underpriced. So if the rate of return is above the yield curve, then the security will be underpriced. If the 
rate of return lies below the yield curve, then the security would be overpriced. So we need to master that. Above, underpriced, below the yield curve, overpriced. And then we now want to briefly examine yield curve theory. And there are four of them. So I, as I said, by way of introduction, I'm not going to look at granular details associated with each and every one of these theories. Each and every one of these theories has got its own, you know, mathematics, uh, theoretical framework assumptions and all of that stuff. So I won't delve into the granular details. I'll just present the basic outline. There are four main theories, which are the pure expectations theory, the liquidity preference theory, the segmented market theory, or market segmentation theory, and the preferred habitat theory. So what ensues are brief definitions, and then a bit of coverage for each one of those theories so that we can have some meaningful appreciation of what each and every one of those theories entails. So when we are looking at the pure expectation theory, this theory assumes that the various maturities are substitutes of each other. When we are looking at financial instruments of various maturities, they are taken to be substitutes of each other. And hence the shape of the yield curve depends on the market's expectation of future interest rates. So according to this theory, Yields tend to change over time, but the theory fails to define the details of the yield curve shapes. And the theory has got the downside of ignoring interest rate risk and reinvestment risk. So that's the brief on the expectations theory or the pure expectations theory, pure expectation theory. Number two is the liquidity preference theory. Uh, this theory is an extension of the pure expectation theory. It seeks to, you know, preach the knowledge gap associated with the pure expectation theory. It adds a premium called the liquidity premium or term premium. So that's what it brings onto the table when we're looking at the pure expectation theory, when it is extending it. It adds a premium called the liquidity premium or term premium. This theory considers the greater risk involved in holding longer long-term debts over short-term debts. And then we have got um, we have got the seg segmented market theory. This uh, hypothesis is based on the separate demand and supply relationship between short-term securities and long-term securities. It's based on the fact that uh, financial instruments of different maturities cannot be substituted for one another. So it's, all, it's the exact opposite of for the other theories. Like your pure expectation theory, which holds that uh, financial instruments of various maturities are substitutes. This one says no, they are not substitutes. They can financial instruments of different uh, maturities cannot be substituted for one another, since they are risk profile, and also their ability to give us a, a yield as investors are radically different. Since investors would generally prefer short-term maturity securities, if, if we assume that investors are risk adverse, over long-term maturity securities, because the former offers lower risk, whilst the data is associated with the higher risk, then the yield will be correspondingly lower. And then we've got the preference habitat theory, or hypothesis, or the preferred habitat theory. 
which is an extension of the market segmentation theory. According to this theory, investors prefer a certain investment horizon because it's been, it's been seen in empirical studies that certain types of investors have got certain risk profiles that are characterize their investment decisions. And that is certain investors prefer certain investment horizon. And that this is not really a game of chance. It's something which tends to recay even in different kinds of financial markets. Financial markets with different levels of depth. To invest outside this horizon will require some premium. So if you are to incentivize otherwise risk averse investors who normally go short term, you have to give them a risky premium to sort of pull them out of the woods, so to speak, so that they invest outside their horizon or their comfort zone. It might be the same investors who actually invest in different horizons, but to, because they are rational, and the, our assumption is that they, they'll be having a reasonable awareness about the state or the level of risk that they expose themselves to when they invest in, in different securities. Therefore, the compensation by way of the yields uh, must reflect the risk that they, they'll be bearing or the risk that they'll be taking on. So that is part of that. So we look, want to just check the salient features, the key features of the pure expectations theory, also called the expectations hypothesis. This hypothesis, as I've already observed when I was introducing the, this concept, this hypothesis assumes that uh, securities of various maturities are perfect substitutes and suggests that the shape of the yield curve depends on market, part market participants' expectations of future interest rates. So the thing which affects the shape of the yield curve is markets, market participants' expectations of future interest rates. It assumes that market forces will cause the interest rates on various terms of bonds or tenures of bonds to be such that the expected final value of a sequence of short-term investments will equal the non-final value of a single long-term investment. So there is this equality between the expected va final value of a sequence of self, so to speak, short-term investments and a single long-term investment. If the short-term investments uh, are investments over a year, which are rolled over to another year, rolled over to another year until we reach the third year, it means correspondingly we'll be also having a three-year bond. If we have short terms of a year up to 10 years, it means also correspondingly we'll be having a 10-year bond. And the, the assumption is that market forces will cause interest rates on various terms, this one year term, one year short term bonds, to be such that they, they are expected final value. Since they are a sequence of short term investments, will equal the known final value of a single long term investment of, say, five years or 10 years or even 30 years. If this did not hold, the theory assumes that investors would quickly demand more of the current short term or long term bonds, whichever gives the higher expected long term yield. And this would drive down the return on current bonds of that term and drive up the yield on current bonds of the other term so as to quickly make the assumed equality of expected returns of the two investment approaches hold. So that's the uh, situation, which is what I just explained. So using this uh, reasoning, future rates along with the assumption that arbitrage opportunities are actually minimal 
in futures markets. And that futures rates are unbiased estimates of forthcoming spot rates. This provides enough information to construct a complete expected yield curve. Uh, by way of example, if investors have an expectation of what one year interest rate, one year interest rate will be next year, the second year interest rate, interest rate can be calculated as the compounding of this current year's interest rate by next year's expected one year interest rate. And more general returns, which is one plus yield on a long-term instrument are assumed to equal the geometric mean, not the arithmetic one, of the expected returns on a series of short-term uh, financial instruments. So when we are looking at returns of a long term, this is the long term, where the limit is N, maybe five years. If N is five years, so the expected return for the first year would be one plus I S T, the short term interest rate of year one, multiplied by one plus the short term interest rate of year two plus one plus the short term interest rate of year three plus i mean multiplied by one plus the short term interest rate of year four up to year five where ist and ilt are the expected short term and actual long term interest rates so if it is ist it's the expected short term interest rate if it is ILT, is the actual long-term interest rate, which is known a priori. But I, ST year one is the actual observed short-term interest rate for the first year, which we say it will be fed into the um, current second year interest rate, which can be calculated as the compounding of this year's observed interest rate by next year's expected interest rate. So for the first year, the interest rate will be known. And then next year, we just compound uh, this year's interest rate by next year's expected one year interest rate. This theory is consistent with the observation that yields usually move to Ken. However, it fails to explain the persistence of the shape of the yield curve. And then the theory also neglects the interest rate risk, which is inherent in investing in bonds. We know that bonds, they, in general, even when we're not looking at different tenors of bonds, they are some of the most interest sensitive financial assets or assets that exist in any economy. And then we move on to the liquidity premium theory. This theory is, is actually an offshoot which tries to bridge the gap in knowledge of the pure expectation theory or the expectations hypothesis. It has said that long term interest rates not only reflect investors' assumptions about future rates, but also include this risk premium for holding longer term bonds. Investors uh, are held to prefer short term bonds to long term bonds because of the assumption that they are risk adverse on average. And this premium is called the term premium or the liquidity premium. This premium compensates investors for the added risk of having their money tied up for a longer period of time, including the greater price of uncertainty. The economic situation may change because of geopolitical tensions like what is happening between uh, 
Russia and Ukraine, the war between Russia and Ukraine, those sister or brother nations threatening to destabilize the whole corporate uh, economic or financial architecture. So this, this fits into, you know, expectation. Uh, it also fits into uncertainty. So if someone is investing long term, there is no way of telescoping the occurrence of some events like the Russia-Ukraine war, which may destabilize financial markets or introduce an external shock to financial markets. And because of the term premium, longer term or long term bond, bonds yields or yield, yields tend to be higher than the short term yield and the yield curve slopes upwards. And long term yields are also higher, not just because of the liquidity premium, but also because of the risk premium. So in addition to the liquidity premium, there is also a risk premium, which is added by the risk of default from holding a security over the longer term. If someone is holding onto a financial asset over the longer term and economic conditions change and they become adverse, the risk of default actually increases at a risk pass. So uh, sticking to our equality, because this theory is just a modification of the pure expectations theory. So what it brings onto the table in this geometric mean, where the, the geometric mean of all short-term yields of financial assets must equate with the observed yield, long-term yield of this financial asset. So we have added RRP N to what we already had in the pure expectations theory as our as our equality between the long term yield uh, and the, the 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 geometric mean of short term yield so what is this rpm it is the risk premium which is associated with an n period point the n period point is shown as a superscript there that the limit of the time horizon or the tenure of the financial instrument is actually n, which may be five years or 30 years, whatever the case may be. So if it is 30 years, then RPN is the risk premium associated with the 30th year of investment. And then the preferred appetite theory uh, is a variant of the liquidity premium. So it builds or modifies the liquidity premium theory and states that in addition to interest rate expectations, investors have distinct investment horizon and require a meaningful premium to hold bonds. a meaningful premium to buy bonds with maturities outside their preferred maturity or habitat. So we're not talking about um, habitat, we are talking about the preferred maturity of a particular bond. You have got the three month treasury pins. So if someone is to invent, I mean invest in a six month or a nine month or a 12 month treasury pin, that person is now investing outside their preferred maturity, which is short-term maturity, because of their risk adverse nature. So they need to be incentivized or compensated with the, uh, you know, um, a certain premium, a meaningful premium. 
to incentivize their buying behavior. And proponents of this hypothesis believe that short-term investors are more prevalent in fixed income markets. And therefore, longer term rates tend to be higher than short term rates for the most part. And short term rates can be higher than long term rates occasionally. So, for the most part, uh, longer term rates tend to be higher than short term rates. It will be a highly unusual situation for longer term rates to be lower than short term rates for the most part. It will be an operation from what we expect a normal market, uh, how we expect a normal market to behave. Given what I'm going to cover also under this course outline, the efficient market hypothesis, which I'll just cover also briefly in one presentation tomorrow. But then short term rates can be higher than long term rates occasionally. And this hypothesis is consistent with both the persistence of the normal yield curve shape and the tendency of the yield curve to shift, shift the up or down while retaining its shape. And then finally, we have got the market segmentation theory. This hypothesis is also called the segmented market hypothesis. And financial instruments are number one, not substitutable. So we deviate totally from the pure expectations theory. In that, there is this notion that markets exist as some sort of self-contained silos where they are actually segmented. So the supply and demand in the markets for short-term and long-term instruments is largely independent was determined largely independent. So prospective investors decide in advance whether they need short-term or long-term instruments. If investors prefer their portfolio to be liquid, this, the corollary the coroller is that they will prefer short-term instruments to longer-term instruments. So the implication is that if investors are actually risk averse, which is what will cause them to prefer their portfolio to be liquid. Or they've got certain obligations which cause them to prefer a liquid portfolio. We would expect them to invest short term or to invest in short term instruments vis a vis investing in long, long term instruments. So if that holds, then the market for short term instruments will have higher demand. The third is paribas. So the higher demand for the instrument implies that the price of the financial instrument will increase and become high. And this will lower the yield because the yield is actually interest sensitive. This explains the stylized effect that short term yields are usually lower than longer term yields because of that aspect of the risk premium. Where a person really needs to be compensated for investing long term. So this hypothesis explains the predominance of the normal yield curve shape in financial markets. And however, because of the supply and the demand of the two markets are independent, this theory fails to explain the observed effect that yields tend to move together upward or downward shift in the, in the curve. So the theory has got its own limitations as pointed out in the point that I've just um, um, covered. So this is just the brief content that I thought of covering under this topic. Should you want to invest, investigate more details you, you are free to Google all of this stuff that I've been covering and even to check other video presentations of the uh, lecturers and other finance professionals who have presented on this topic of the term structure of interest rates. So in our next topic, uh, or in our next lecture rather, we'll look at um,
the efficient market hypothesis, we we'll look at three forms of the efficient market hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that I looked at length when I was doing my PhD thesis because I was looking at commodity price volatility, stock market performance, and the economic growth. So I was investigating this triangular relationship or this tripartite relationship uh, when you are looking at a commodity price volatility, stock market performance, and economic growth. We know in the ordinary run of things, stock markets and commodity markets are expected in the steady state, whether it's attainable or it's just an idealistic concept, it's a debate for another day. They are expected to be efficient. We can have the strong, semi-strong and the weak form, efficiency. Or we may completely depart from the efficient market hypothesis. Like um, myself, I had to rely on notions to do with the chaos theory. Uh, I implemented a bit of chaos theory when I implemented the fractionally integrated catch model or the five catch model and the Markov regime switching model. Because I didn't really believe that commodity markets follow the efficient market hypothesis, either the strong, semi-strong or weak form efficiency of the weak form efficiency. Even financial markets, you know, that are associated with those uh, commodity markets uh, or financial derivatives associated with the certain specific commodities. My belief was that we are likely to explain uh, price volatilities because I was not even interested in modeling the behavior of prices, but the, the volatility of the prices. Uh, uh, my assumption was that you are likely to, to have a correct profile of the volatility of uh, commodity prices. When you assume that you know, markets are prone to deviating from this idealistic state of an efficient market. So that's that. Don't want to trap you with a lot of details that I may never actually come. You can consult my PhD thesis for more of the theoretical framework which informed my analysis of asset price behavior. Uh, and you read chapter two, where I dwelt on issues to do with the, uh, you know, efficiency, financial market efficiency, or just market efficiency, notions of market efficiency, uh, theories of storage, and so on, and also chaos theory. Um, uh, I, of course, chaos theory, I styled it by another name. Uh, in chapter two of that thesis. But, uh, uh, you know, to gain an appreciation of how financial markets or even money markets operate, it's always interesting to, to, to revisit the efficient market hypothesis and sort of use it as a benchmark for understanding even those markets that are more often prone to deviating from this notion of an efficient market hypothesis, all the other things being constant. So thank you so much for listening in. I appreciate your time. So in the next lecture, I'll be covering uh, briefly the efficient market hypothesis before I delve into one or two topics that uh, actually summarize our course outline. I thank you so much.